All right, welcome again. We've got critical mass. So I'm gonna get us rolling. For those of you who just joined, I ask that folks introduce themselves in the chat and share their favorite tree. Um, so welcome to the final session of this year's Carbon Friendly Forestry Conference. Uh, the topic for this panel is an exciting one, in my view, uh, the Pacific Northwest debut of the Climate Smartwood Group. For those of you who don't know me yet, my name's Rachel Baker. I'm the Forest Program Director at Washington Environmental Council, and I will be moderating this final session today. So we'll start off with a few logistical notes that you have heard by now, but first and most importantly, um, we're having an in-person happy hour tonight at Optimism Brewing in Seattle uh, from 5.30 to 7. So if you're in town, come join us. We'll talk forestry. Um, on more technical logistical notes, if you run into any issues during the session or have any questions about the conference, you can email the address that's pinned in the chat box to the right of the webinar screen. And you can use the chat to send messages, but keep in mind that any messages you send will be visible to all attendees. If you'd like to submit any questions to the speakers, please use the Q&A feature um, on the bottom of your uh, Zoom bar, um, which is uh, yeah, the Zoom toolbar on the bottom of your webinar screen. We'll be sorting through the questions and presenting them to the speakers at the end of the presentation. Uh, and as a reminder, this session will be recorded and shared with all participants next week. So logistics behind us, let's get started. Uh, interest in wood building materials and mass timber is on the rise as builders and developers pursue green building and building decarbonization. As a result, owners, developers, architects, and engineers are confronted with challenging questions about wood product sourcing. How do we know if forestry is exacerbating or mitigating climate change? How can we move towards more data-driven differentiation of forest product supply chains? And how do we get climate smart wood into our construction projects? The Climate Smart Wood Group was created to help the building sector in North America identify and procure climate smart wood products, those produced from climate smart forestry and recycled or reclaimed sources. This panel is the Pacific Northwest debut of the Climate Smart Wood Group, featuring many of the members of this uh, group's leadership council. This is a topic near and dear to my heart, as WEC is also a founding member, and I sit on the leadership council along with many of these folks. So we have quite the brain trust here uh, with a large percent of the leadership council plus a, a partner uh, and an ally um, on the architecture side. So the panel will discuss what is driving interest in wood as a climate project, uh, procurement from the perspective of an end user, the pathways to climate smart forestry for landowners and land managers, the technical challenges of carbon accounting across the wood supply chain, and an introduction to the climate smart wood group and our upcoming work through the USDA Climate Smart Commodities Grant Program. I hope you find that this panel brings together many of the topics you've heard about over the last two days. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce our fantastic group of presenters. Uh, first, we have Brad Kahn, Director of Communications at the Forest Stewardship Council US. Uh, Timothy Cook is an Associate Architect at Lever Architecture. Seth Zuckerman is the Executive Director of the Northwest Natural Resources Group. David Diaz is the Director of Forestry Analytics and Technology at EcoTrust. Micah Sanofsky is the Green Markets Manager at Sustainable Northwest. And Aaron Everett is the Director of the Climate Smart Wood Group. So with that group, you can tell we've got a lot of content to go through. I will be merciless with time. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it off to Brad to get us going. Thanks all. Thanks so much, Rachel. Really appreciate it and appreciate the opportunity to uh, to say a few words here today. Um, so uh, I titled this brief presentation as the genie is out of the bottle. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about high level initiatives that are driving demand for transparency in forest product supply chains, uh, you know, and, and specifically around uh, carbon emissions and removals and and much like uh, a genie coming out of a bottle. I believe that transparency is one of those things that uh, once people get a little bit of it, they want they always want more. They never want less. Uh, and, and so I, I feel like um, this is kind of a one way valve. So what's driving it? So first of all, we see trends in mass timber. Um, you know, this is from a, a, some data that Woodworks put together, an industry association. Um, clearly, there is a trend here. Uh, but really, the question in my mind is, you know, is this good or is this bad? 
uh, mass timber in and of itself is is you know a, a forest product. It's it it, it can be a, a tool to really improve uh, and restore the way forests are managed, or it can be a forest to further degrade and and drive deforestation. So on its own, this doesn't really tell us anything. But when you listen to uh, the the people and organizations that are really driving this growth, what you hear is a lot of demand for mass timber to be a climate solution. And that frequently means uh, a lower embodied carbon uh, alternative to concrete and steel. Uh, it also might mean a way to restore forests, pri primarily around wildfire mitigation, you know, taking out small trees uh, to reduce the, the risk of catastrophic wildfire. It might mean rural jobs, but but you don't necessarily know that just from this kind of information. Y you need more information, you need greater transparency in order to make that judgment call of whether, you know, mass timber is a net good or a net a net bad. Um, in parallel with mass timber, and frankly driven by much of the same kind of market dynamic, uh, is growth in voluntary carbon markets. Again, you don't know necessarily if this is good or bad. And frankly, I, I bet on this call we have some people who think this isn't so great because carbon offsets are um, a, a point of some contention. But this is the market trend up in the upper left. You can see kind of where we've been. And in the kind of on the right side, you can see where we're projected to go. And, uh, you know, there's lots of ways to do nature based solutions. There's lots of ways to do voluntary carbon credits. Uh, but but forestry is really at the top of the pile uh, on both of those things. And both in terms of the price for a credit, which you can see uh, is about five dollars and 40 cents. Um, this is from Ecosystem Marketplace, which is an, an industry uh, organization that really tracks this information, um, and and as well as volume, 227.7 million tons of CO2 equivalent uh, from 2020. So these numbers have gone up since then. But again, this same dynamic says we need more information to determine you know, whether this is really sequestering lots of additional carbon. Are these high quality credits? Uh, this is fueling demand for transparency. So behind the scenes, and probably a little lesser known, are a couple really critical uh, reporting platforms and goal setting platforms. So the Science-Based Targets Initiative and the Greenhouse Gas Protocol are two critical initiatives. There are many others, but these have huge uptake. So right now, about 91% of global GDP is under some sort of a public sector net zero goal you know, by a certain date, whether it's 2050 is, is a very common one set under the Paris Agreement, but there are others. 90% um, of the Fortune 500 is using the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. And, and, and this protocol is how do companies measure and report their emissions? This is a system for credibly measuring and reporting emissions. Right now, 90% of the Fortune 500, lots of other companies too, but just in terms of the, the impact it's having. Science-based targets is really encouraging companies to set targets that are in line with the Paris Climate Agreement. And, and right now, more than 2,000 companies have set targets, including um, this list on the left side, which is designed to make your eyes go um, crosswise. But you get a sense. There's, there's certainly some big players here, and in, including some big players who are also driving a lot of mass timber development. So you see a company like AECOM, Apple, uh, Microsoft. Uh, there, are, there are lots of big players here that are not only you know, looking at their emissions from their from their primary you know business operations, but also emissions from uh, the buildings that they build. And you know, this trend line for 2022 we expect to increase um, you know commensurately from 2021. So this idea of setting credible goals and really measuring and reporting emissions, not just tied to energy use or tied to manufacturing facilities, but tied to land use. That's the key innovation that these platforms are really driving is what, you know, what did we do on the land, not just from forestry, but from other commodities as well. And we need to measure and report those emissions. So I would put forward that with so much momentum behind these platforms and so many goals around credible uh, net zero uh, emissions, the genie is not going back into the bottle. 
there's huge momentum for companies to measure and report emissions and removals generally tied to land use specifically. Land use is tricky. You know, it's it's not surprising that figuring out the methodologies, which we'll go into in a moment about measuring and, and reporting these emissions uh, lags other sources, like say the scope two emissions of energy sector, but they're developing rapidly and they're driven by demand and technology, things like uh, artificial intelligence and uh, remote sensing. So right now the timber industry is lagging. Much of the information provided to construction professionals says, we're going to just assume the forestry is carbon neutral and on a continental scale that's good enough you know trees are growing in north america net on a net basis thus carbon neutrality is a conservative assumption that assumption is not good enough anymore people are really asking for more granular information whether it's at the level of a forest management unit or a landscape or an ownership classification or maybe some a county some other detail but but the, the carbon neutrality assumption is yesterday's news. There is a huge body of momentum pushing for more transparency. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my friend, Timothy Cook uh, from Lever to take it away. Thank you, Timothy. All right, uh, thank you, Brad. Um, so I'm gonna be telling you a little bit about myself and the firm that I work for and how our approach to wood procurement has evolved uh, over the past few years. Hopefully you'll come away from these uh, 10 minutes with a sense for some of the challenges and innovations that are occurring within the architecture, engineering and construction sector today. So I'm an architect with um, over 15 years of experience and I've been working with Lever uh, for the past six years. When I first came to Lever in 2016, the firm was just starting to be known for being one of the first architecture firms in the region, region to uh, design really groundbreaking mass timber projects. Uh, some of you might already know, uh, Lever was one of the first architecture firms in the region to experiment with uh, mass timber products. Um, Lever has been instrumental in promoting the nascent mass, mass timber industry in the Pacific Northwest. and. Really, the first example is in 2016 with the Albina Yard project, which was the first uh, project uh, built with domestically fabricated uh, CLT. Uh, here's some images of that project. Uh, and uh, an image of the panels, uh, the mass timber panels being installed with a mount hood in the background. Uh, and this is uh, in uh, down in, in, here in Portland, Oregon. Um, and then in uh, 2000, oh, and sorry, this is an image of the press that was used to make those uh, CLT panels down in Riddle, Oregon at the uh, DR Johnson fabrication facility. Um, and then in 2017 with the 12 story framework, framework project, uh, which was the first mass timber high rise to receive approval for construction in the US. Uh, unfortunately, this building was never built um, but it set the stage for the future of wood high-rise projects um, in the U.S., um, for example, the Ascent Tower in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, Lever also, uh, oh yeah, so this, these are um, some images of all of the testing that went into getting that uh, high-rise uh, project permitted. Um, and that uh, uh, testing was uh, grant, uh, funded through over $2 million of uh, grant funding, uh, which really set the stage for um, this uh, typology to be built. Um, Lever uh, was also um, instrumental in designing some of the first experimental structures in uh, uh, using mass plywood panels, which is another product that was um, uh, a product uh, invented here in Oregon. Um, and so this time when I started at Lever was really exciting and I was enthusiastic to learn as much as I could about mass timber. I was especially intrigued by the idea of uh, regionally sourcing these materials um, and the compelling connection that could be fostered between rural forestry economies and urban development. Um, our founder, uh, the founder of Lever, uh, Thomas Robinson, uh, he likes to talk about being inspired by the farm to table movement within the restaurant industry. Um, you know, we all really wanna be able to eat ethically sourced food products uh, that are locally grown. And he likes to ask the question, can we really think of sourcing our building materials in a similar way? 
Um, sometimes this is affectionately called um, the, uh, the forest to frame movement uh, in homage to the farm to table movement. Um, and this to, approach to building uh, has inspired me because I'm actually uh, from Oregon and grew up in real close proximity to the timber industry. Um, sorry about that. So I actually grew up in uh, the central coast range of Oregon, right in the smack in the heart of one of the most productive tree growing regions in the world. And my family actually owns a 19 acre, uh, acre parcel of forest land near the town of Alsea. And I was actually a kid in the late 80s and early 90s during the height of the timber wars. And although my family did not work uh, directly in the forest, we were surrounded by the forest and many of our neighbors worked in the forest and um, were some way connected to, uh, to the forest. And you know, I, I saw as a kid how much anger and fear there was um, as the timber wars raged and you know even uh, my older sister uh, got arrested uh, as a teenager for civil disobedience um, actions to stop uh, the cutting of old growth. Uh, but it really wasn't until um, I started learning more about where wood products I now specify as an architect come from that I began to connect my experience as a child with my current work in the building industry. And I've had the privilege of learning about the forest, about forest ecology over the past few years. And um, I've even been lucky enough to take some really amazing forest tours with some of the folks on this panel. Um, and so as Lever has learned about the nuances of wood sourcing over the years, our approach has evolved as we've gained a deeper understanding of the forest and the wood supply chain. So really briefly, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of three projects that really illustrate this evolution within our firm. Uh, the first project is the Oregon Conservation Center for the Nature Conservancy. Uh, this is located in Portland, Oregon. For this project, in many ways, we stumbled into the process of intentional wood sourcing. Uh, TNC came to us with a really strong set of values and goals. Uh, they wanted to showcase the conservation work that they do in Oregon by utilizing project uh, products that are sourced from their conservation site, uh, sites throughout the state. Um, through our partnership with um, Sustainable Northwest Wood, which is a local sustainable wood product supplier, uh, many of you I'm sure are aware of, um, as well as our partnership with the contractor, we were able to source some really amazing wood for this project. So I'm just going to go through this really quickly. Um, the, uh, this is the exterior of the building. Uh, the juniper siding uh, for this project uh, was sourced from the TNC's Juniper Hills Preserve, which is in central Oregon. And uh, this wood was removed as part of a native grasslands restoration project, really um, allowing uh, diverse grasslands to reestablish themselves. And, um, you know, juniper just sucks a lot of uh, water out of the soil. And so this process we were able to calculate with the help of um, uh, Sustainable Northwest would um, over almost a, a million gallons of water each year um, onto the landscape. Uh, this is an image of uh, some of the furniture that was built out of sea, uh, out of juniper inside of the building. Um, and then this is an image of the um, the pavilion structure that was part of this project that was built out of FSC certified CLT uh, dug for CLT that was uh, sourced from Northern California forests. And this project was one of the first FSC certified CLT um, projects in the country. Um, and this is an image of the, the uh, space uh, as it's finished. Um, and then a few more uh, cool products. The uh, decking on the exterior of the building is FSC certified Western Red Cedar sourced from TNC's Ellsworth Creek, uh, Creek Preserve. Um, where all old growth restoration projects are occurring um, to restore um, those uh, forest ecologies. Um, and then finally, the some of the millwork on the interior is dug fir that uh, was FSC certified. And we were able to trace the credits back to the Coquille tribe um, on the Oregon coast. Uh, and this image I'll just end with on this project. I love it because all of these different uh, wood products are, are shown. You can see all of them in this one image here. Um, 
So the, the second project um, I'm going to talk about is Meyer Memorial Trust. This project, um, again, the client uh, asked for intentional material sourcing. Um, Meyer Memorial Trust is a mission-driven organization where uh, they really wanted to focus on bringing equity into the equation. Um, and for this project, we were able to, with our uh, client and our developer partner, really engage with um, uh, a wood advisor role that a Sustainable Northwest provided um, and uh, Paul Vanderfort at a Sustainable Northwest. And we were able to take what we learned at TMC and develop a more formalized process for making intentional wood procurement decisions. Um, there's a really great uh, white paper written by Paul that describes in detail the system that the project used to select wood products. And I highly recommend checking that out. Um, so just uh, mentioning the uh, really mission-driven nature of this organization was really the true catalyst for these um, outcomes. Uh, Meyer uh, was able to um, put together a project team that was incredibly diverse, um, not just in terms of leadership, but also all of the um, contractors and subcontractors. Um, there were these really ambitious goals for equity and diversity um, on those teams. Um, here's some images of the space. Um, and then this is also a project, uh, one of the first buildings to be built using uh, mass plywood panels. Um, you can see the panels coming into the building and under construction and um, completed and uh, the uh, image of the space. So for this project, it was really, um, there were kind of three levels of uh, criteria for sourcing wood. Um, the first was to source wood products from rural, tribal, or uh, women, in, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, minority women in um, emerging small businesses, and to try to ensure ecological forest management practices from those sources. Um, second was to prioritize FSC certified wood, um, ecological forest restoration projects, um, recycled wood, or urban salvage trees. And then kind of the baseline requirement for this project was to prioritize wood from the region. So Oregon first, Pacific Northwest second, and uh, North America third. And if you're able to bring us to a, a close on your slides shortly. Yes, yes I am. I'm Fabulous. just Thank wrapping you. up here. So this project was really able to um, support uh, rural forestry based jobs, uh, communities, and innovation in the mass timber sector and support um, BIPOC and women-owned businesses. And so really, um, uh, this is a map showing all of the sources of products and uh, suppliers and fabricators for this uh, project. And then um, I guess what I wanted to just leave everyone with is these two projects really were a catalyst for the firm. And now um, currently we're really um, trying to um, formalize this process and really communicate with our clients how uh, the wood uh, supply chain works and, and partner with folks such as Paul Vanderford at Sustainable Northwest uh, in a wood advisor role and really um, communicate to clients the value that you can gain by um, collaborating um, in this way. Uh, and then I think maybe I'll just wrap up by saying, you know, we're now trying to really um, uh, right into our specifications, the procurement um, of timber and the requirements that we want to um, uh, achieve. And so this is just an example of a uh, current project that we're working on where um, we ha have those types of um, requirements in the, in the project. So I will wrap up now. Um, and so, uh, Next, we have uh, Seth Zuckerman uh, presenting. All right, thank you, Timothy. Um, so uh, Northwest Natural Resource Group is a, is a nonprofit based in Seattle with field staff also in Tacoma, Olympia, and Hoquiam. Let's see, ah, Oop. ah, there we go. Um, and uh, we work with landowners to help them understand, design, and implement ecological forestry, a pathway that we see as including climate savviness as one of its elements. Um, by that, I mean adjusting forest management in light of 
uh, impending climate change. So what are the elements of that? Um, we think about mitigation to remove carbon dioxide from the air, adaptation to make forests more resilient in the face of, of climate change, and equity. And we recognize uh, the importance of equity, but for us, that's not something that we can often work help our landowners and uh, clients to work with, but mitigation and adaptation are two that we can. And what I wanna talk about in, in the next few minutes is just the ways in which Climate, uh, climate smart forestry requires some additional effort. It's not the easiest path, uh, but it, with effort and patience, it's something that we can help land on, landowners to adapt to. Uh, so one of the key factors that we think about is the way that uh, summers are predicted to be hotter and drier in the Pacific Northwest, and so moisture will become a more limiting factor for forests. With only so much water to go around, we recommend spreading it among fewer trees by thinning the stand. Um, this is a, an image of a stand before it was thinned, and then a nearby stand, not the same one, after thinning, just to give you a sense of what kind of uh, change this brings about in the forest. Uh, seen from above, there's an unthinned stand on the left at the Nisqually Community Forest, which uh, we heard about earlier this afternoon in a presentation by Justin Hall. Um, and then similarly on the right-hand side, the, the stand as it, as it was thinned. Uh, we can see here a before and after of the same spot from the same photo point. Um, and though, and... Um, you can see how with fewer, as it were, straws stuck into the uh, soil, there'd be less moisture sucked up. And so the available moisture can be spread around to fewer trees. Now, coincidentally, as people who were part of the, uh, who came to the panel on extended rotations will remember, thinning is also a key strategy in that extended rotation uh, idea that uh, Paula and Rachel and Sean presented on then. On the east side, uh, Fire is a key piece here in reducing the risk of uh, prescribed fire is a key way of reducing the risk of uncontrolled catastrophic fire that we're expecting to be more of a threat uh, as, uh, as climate change worsens. We saw in the Saikan March, Marsh in Southern Oregon after the bootleg fire uh, a year or two ago that reducing fuel loads through prescribed fire reduces the damage that you can expect from more severe fires. There are other techniques of adaptation as well. Uh, seed lot selection, for example, to introduce new genetics into the forest that will be better adapted to climate change. But um, mitigation is another story. Uh, and I think a key thing to, to consider is that short rotation plantation forestry is not a climate smart approach. Um, this here is a satellite view of part of Pierce County, the industrial timber basket of Puget Sound. And how do we know that this isn't the most climate smart landscape? It's because we see so much bare ground, which tells me that a lot of the potential carbon sequestration of this site is going underutilized as sunlight falls on soil instead of on photosynthesizing needles. To manage greater climate wisdom, uh, we're going to need to uh, take account of the potential of the forest to sequester more carbon uh, and somehow reconcile that with uh, the hurdle rates and internal ROI expectations that investors use in setting their harvest schedules. Um, people who, anyone who went to uh, forestry school is familiar with this graph, but it charts the way the growth of a forest changes over its age. And so the dash line shows the amount of growth being put on every year by that forest as it ages. And then the solid line is the average over time. So the, the growth starts out um, quick, slows down. And as it slows down, it crosses that average line, which has been rising uh, since the beginning of um, uh, uh, since the stand was established. And a silviculturist would tell you to cut the, the forest uh, at that peak where the blue lines, uh, where the blue line is. Uh, but if you're in a hurry, you might instead cut at the brown line because you're looking for those, those quick returns. And then what you see then is that the 
average you're producing per year as seen on the on the vertical axis in cubic feet per acre per year you sacrifice about a third of what the uh, forest can produce so you know we modeled this in uh, in FVS which is a much uh, nothing quite as sophisticated as, as what Sean uh, did for Rachel and uh, Paula uh, in the presentation we saw earlier today but we just modeled what an acre could produce over several short rotations uh, versus over a bunch of long, uh, over a couple of longer rotations. And what you see is here is that not only does the forest in the, the green store more carbon, but you also see that uh, it produces more product over time. That's the amount of carbon stored in the, in the blue. Um, and that, uh, and the, then the red is what winds up in the landfill after it was used. You total it all up over 100 years, uh, about 54,000 board feet uh, per acre are produced in the short rotation scenario and a little over 82,000 in the long rotation. And the long rotation stores about 50% more carbon uh, in all these different pools than the, um, than the short rotation scenario does. Uh, but the key question is timing. Uh, over, time, you know, over time, you produce more timber, but there is a bit of a lag. It takes till the second thinning uh, for the forest to catch up. The green line is the long rotation harv cumulative harvest, and the red line is the cumulative harvest for short rotations. So it takes a bit of time for it to catch up. And the question is, how do you then produce enough uh, to produce enough return for the landowner to want to do that. Will people want to pay for more wood, pay more for wood that's raised in a climate smart way? For that, we need a market, which Timothy spoke to, and a metric, which David Diaz is about to discuss. The key thing, the key message I want to leave you with is that climate smarter forestry takes time, but the results are worth waiting for. And as with the penguins here, you can only accomplish that in partnership. Thank you, and I'll pass it off now to David Diaz from Ecotrust. Thanks, Seth. Uh, so I'm going to give uh, everyone here kind of a quick roundup uh, of some of the developments that I've seen happening over uh, the course of 2022, some of the work that we've been leading, and some of the work that's being queued up uh, in terms of uh, forest monitoring and impact assessment that we'll be carrying forward under the new uh, climate smart commodities uh, uh, grant that Micah will talk much more about in terms of the broader broader uh, partnership here. Um, but so I'll step through each of these, you know, first talking about some of the research that Ecotrust has been leading and uh, some a co-production process that we've been doing in partnership with the Carbon Leadership Forum. Uh, and then I'll very quickly run through uh, a couple other important updates, you know, uh, uh, by other organizations here um, and then close with uh, uh, what I see coming up uh, at, at the end. So um, right around the last Carbon Friendly Forestry Conference, we released a bunch of data from some of our kind of proof of concept analysis of looking at publicly available data on uh, carbon stock change and timber output by different ownerships uh, across five states in the Northwest. So you can find this, it's an interactive map uh, um, uh, at this link here. And uh, we were uh, uh, in particular interested in unpacking this a little bit further. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the analysis that we've done since then to look in particular at how tribes uh, are performing across the, the, the United States uh, and then zooming in on the Northwest in particular. Uh, so one of the things that, that we were able to do with this kind of uh, um, continental or at least contiguous U.S. Uh, uh, data set was that we were able to uh, uh, identify what the carbon stock trends were across federally recognized tribes. Uh, um, across the United States. And we compare that with some of the timber output reporting uh, that's been generated uh, uh, by tribes and uh, uh, reported by the Bureau of Indian Affairs to Congress. Uh, um, and so we're looking at this window from 2005 to 2015, and we've got uh, 57 tribes that are being visualized in terms of how the carbon stock change from 1990 uh, occurred up till uh, 2017. Uh, and so what you see here is there's a lot of lines all over the place, but a lot of the lines are above zero, okay? Um, and when we when we dug into a little bit more, the tribes that are below zero are generally in places where it's actually a climate smart thing to do to reduce uh, to reduce carbon stocks uh, right now. 
Um, so we zoomed in a little bit uh, uh, instead in Western Oregon and Washington. So this is a place where we feel much more comfortable saying that climate smart and carbon friendly are very closely aligned. And so what we're looking at here on the left is that same graph now just looking at tribes in Western Oregon and Washington that have produced more than a million board feet of timber uh, over this time frame and industry land in Western Oregon and Washington. And so what you see looking at the industry land that is hovering around zero, there's a lot of variability uh, on it. But when you look at tribes, it's all above zero. Every single timber producing tribe in Western Oregon and Washington uh, had higher carbon stocks at the end of the time than they did in 1990. So this is a great example of how this carbon neutrality assumption is inequitable uh, in the way that it's put into, in, into practice. And it discriminates against tribal forest producers. Um, and so one of the things we're really interested in spotlighting is some of the tribal leadership uh, uh, in climate smart forestry moving ahead. Um, so uh, um, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, Carbon Leadership Forum uh, uh, partnered with us to convene a large technical advisory committee. And over the course of, of 2022, We've had five uh, separate meetings with folks that are representing uh, uh, the timber industry, tribal forestry, state forestry. I don't need to read this out. We've got a great uh, brain trust of folks that have kind of helped us step through uh, what data can we use, what are appropriate ways to validate it, what types of claims can be made or caveats need to be uh, generated. And these are the types of things that we're expecting to produce uh, uh, early next year. Um, uh, so probably by the end of Q1, uh, uh, we'll be releasing a lot more information like this. Um, if you're interested, you can actually review the committee charter here, including all the members uh, uh, by name uh, uh, following that link. Um, and uh, just really grateful to have that kind of collaboration here. Um, looking at some of the other initiatives that developed over 2022 that I just want to mention in brief uh, is that uh, uh, SFI uh, uh, released what they just called a carbon tool. Uh, not the most creative name, but it does demonstrate by example that you can use data like the FIA data to start to do reporting on carbon stock change and timber output at the county and multi-county level. Uh, so they don't differentiate by owner types beyond public and private, um, but it's kind of a proof, proof of concept that there is uh, uh, a lot of good work uh, uh, and a lot of good data uh, that we can keep to dive deeper on, uh, diving deeper on. Um, as Brad mentioned, there was a, a, a new standard released for the corporate GHG accounting, uh, uh, in particular on land sector uh, removals and guidance. We've seen several of the large timber companies, uh, in particular the real estate investment trusts, uh, um, develop new uh, ESG reports that actually apply some of the methods that are in that. Now, when we look at that, though, we see, for example, that typically that reporting is done for investors who are concerned about the entire ownership. So what we see now is you know, companies like Rainier or Potlatch Deltic that have done these reports that report their North American ownership and some of the impact metrics at that scale. Uh, so it's not quite yet getting to this uh, type of granularity that green builders are asking for of, can you tell me what's actually going on in my region? Um, but we do know from reports and, and members of our committee that presented what they did there, that this type of analysis is being done at a very granular scale. Uh, so we know these data exist. We know they're being used right now. They're just not being reported uh, uh, in a way that's directly usable by the design build community. Uh, there was also some developments in terms of uh, um, giving up uh, or at least uh, uh, mothballing an attempt to develop a new product category rule uh, that would supplement the existing product category rule uh, uh, for structural, uh, uh, structural wood products to incorporate what we call upstream or in forest uh, impacts that are observed. Um, and maybe in the Q&A, Brad can talk a little bit about some of the work that FSC is doing to produce a new environmental product declaration that includes uh, uh, this upstream forest impact. So in terms of what's coming up for the Climate Smart Commodities body of work, uh, we'll be concluding this technical advisory committee uh, uh, next year uh, and releasing a lot of data and, and findings you know, uh, uh, from, that, from that work. We'll be developing a... Um, a forest monitoring system that will, over the course of the five-year grant, cover the entire contiguous United States. Uh, and we'll be partnering with Vibrant Planet, uh, who's going to be doing that, uh, uh, bringing all that data up to the present and doing it on an ongoing basis. And we'll be delivering that data. So Vibrant Planet Data Commons, the nonprofit sister company of Vibrant Planet, uh, will be developing an application to consume data like that. Uh, and then we'll also be providing direct support. So in particular, we'll be doing deep dives with tribes uh, around the Northwest and beyond. Uh, to help figure out how to do forest impact reporting and whether or not to use it for marketing uh, and complementing the recent uh, procurement guide 
that was released by the Climate Smart Food Group, uh, 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 primarily for the design build folks, uh, so that we now have forest owners and manufacturers knowing what to do. I think that is the end. Uh, and we'll hand it off to Micah uh, to tell you a little bit more about what we'll be doing coming up. Thanks, David. Let me advance the slides here. Um, I'm Micah Sinovsky with Sustainable Northwest. Um, I'm with the Green Markets team here. Sustainable Northwest as an organization um, works in across the Pacific Northwest to create collaborative problem, uh, create, create collaborative problems. That's what I do every day is mess with collaborative problems, but uh, create collaborative solutions to complex natural resource problems is the way that I actually should be saying that. Um, we, our team has an emphasis on connecting the sort of mostly urban focused demand and for wood products back to uh, the production communities that, uh, grow and introduce those products to the market. And so basically trying to help develop sustainable rural economies that underpin the uh, wood products industry and the green building industry. Um, so collaboratively, uh, a number of the speakers and organizations involved with the Climate Smart Wood Group put in an application to the USDA this past spring uh, for an opportunity very quickly funded through the bipartisan infrastructure law um, to uh, basically promote gain market access and track the climate impacts of climate smart commodities from agriculture and forestry. Um, our collective proposal was awarded $25 million with a focus on building the climate smart wood economy, especially focused in the Pacific Northwest. Um, the three main goals of that collective proposal, and I'll break it down a little bit more in a minute here, but the three main goals are to provide direct supports for forest activities that have climate resiliency and cultural benefits build market value for wood products resulting from that forestry and measure the positive impacts of climate smart forest management promoted, promoted through the direct producer payments. So a very rough overview because we are still working through contract and budget negotiation with USDA. Uh, th there's a good number of details that are still being worked out, but uh, high level. About 60% of that budget is focused on producer supports and workforce development. So basically making sure that the people and the communities on the ground have the resources necessary to be investing in their forests in this way. Uh oh, something's happening with my slides here. Um, well, sorry, I'm going to zoom back through. There we go. Whoa, 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 whoa. I suspect one of the other presenters is touching arrows. Um, okay, but here we are back home. Um, in that pool will be over $10 million in direct producer payments um, arranged, uh, well, managed and arranged through a partnership of organizations, um, including the Northwest Natural Resource Group. Seth was, uh, you know, presented just a few minutes ago. Um, NNRG will be uh, focusing on forest management planning, technical assistance, and implementation for small landowners seeking to adopt and expand climate smart forestry. That'll be bolstered by an innovative workforce development program to incubate the much needed forestry operators capable of executing climate smart forestry in Western, especially in Western Washington and Oregon. Um, to, for anyone who was able to join the uh, rotation length presentation earlier, there was a, a little bit of time dedicated to the need for uh, a workforce to actually implement all of the sort of thinning and you know lighter touch, more frequent entries in forests um, in order to achieve the goals of an, of an initiative like that. And this is very much in line with that. So it should be good news that we've got some resources beginning to flow in that direction. Um, Trout Mountain um, is another partner based in uh, based in Oregon. They're a a forest management firm um, 
a sustainable forest management firm. They're, they'll focus on forest management planning, technical assistance, and innovative as, incentive payments for, again, climate smart forestry adoption, as well as some focused on supply chain efficiency improvements. Um, and Washington Environmental Council has a very cool uh, collaboration with the Pierce Conservation District to pilot a jurisdictional approach to catalyzing climate smart forestry adoption and uh, market recognition for producers adopting those methods. Um, so that'll be a kind of a, I, I guess, a, to borrow Timothy's frame, uh, uh, phrase, forest to frame uh, effort to track uh, wood products produced through climate smart methods in Pierce County through local supply chains and hopefully getting some of those uh, into local projects and, uh, and you know tracking them through supply chains for uh, demand side to be able to get their hands on the on the products. Um, about 15% of the budget will go to supporting markets for fiber sourcing. Um, oh, there's a bullet here that's hidden behind one of the uh, the pictures, so I apologize for that. Sustainable Northwest is also listed on the uh, producer supports side, so I guess I'll tell you about that, which Sustainable Northwest will be focused on um, producer payments direct to uh, at least five tribal partners um, for adoption and expansion of additive uh, climate smart forestry methods. Um, and um, you know, we could say more about that uh, in the Q and A. I'm sure there are a lot of questions about where all those funds are going to flow. Um, Fifteen percent will go to essentially recognizing the products from all of the forestry we're supporting in markets. Uh, a lot more to be said about that through the procurement work that the Climate Smart Wood Group has done. I'll leave that for now, um, and then. Impact measurement. Uh, I'll be repeating a lot of what David just shared about EcoTrust and Vibrant Planet and the embodied carbon work that they're doing. But essentially, this grant provides a pretty substantial amount of funds for those groups to lead and pilot um, first of its kind work to track the the uh, the actual impacts as seen through satellite data, as well as other data sources, um, and, and enable us to connect the impacts of wood products back to the forests and forest types that they came from to more closely achieve the goal of understanding what the uh, climate, ecological, and community impacts are of the wood you buy. So just a really quick look. These are the really ballpark high-level estimates that we give to USDA in our proposal. We expect to sequester 1.3 million additional tons of uh, CO2 equivalent in supported forests over the five years of this grant, restore 66,000 acres to uh, you know, ecological restoration of 66,000 acres through the methods employed on the ground, support sale of a about 130 million board feet of timber and $230 million of climate smart wood products and quantify the impacts of climate smart management on carbon, wildlife behavior, cultural values, and other climate outcomes. Um, and then finally, to build the resources for project teams like uh, lever, as well as so many other folks in the green building side to navigate climate smart wood procurement through pre-design, design, and construction phases. So there's clearly so much detail to fill in there, but just as a teaser of the work to come, I'll leave it there and turn it over to Aaron Everett, director of the Climate Smart Wood Group, to uh, give you a little bit more detail about how uh, the overall collaborative work is progressing. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Micah. Um, when we tried this earlier, uh, I wasn't able to get my slides to advance. So if you hear me calling out for them to uh, move along, that's why. And uh, looks like nothing magical has changed. So here we are. 
Um, we have 10 minutes before the start of the Q&A, and so I'm going to jump through this uh, quicker than I had initially planned to. Um, the the Climate Smart Wood Group uh, was a sort of an outcome of a uh, leadership summit for um, climate, wood, and forest took place in 2021. Um, yeah, many of you probably attended it, but that's that's sort of the thought. Uh, 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 okay, thanks, Rachel. Um, that's sort of the thought process. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so you heard a pretty extensive um, accounting of the opportunity and problem statements uh, around climate smart forestry and trying to expand its adoption. Um, I hope you heard a lot of uh, a lot of optimism and a lot of um, uh, sort of factors that are beginning to align, whether it's uh, global policy or market demand or leadership from the sustainable building sector. I think you know the problem statement is big. Um, but if you begin to think a little bit more specifically about the correspondingly big solution statement, I think you'll start to see uh, some pieces fall into place. And really, uh, the reason I'm involved in this project is because it is a transformative opportunity in front of us. And what the Climate Smart Wood Group is about is transforming and trying to make that you know, happen uh, through practical channels. So uh, what that means is we spent a pretty fair amount of time both in the summit and post uh, developing a actual definition, a, a beginning framework of a definition of what climate smart forestry actually means. We spent a substantial amount of time, again, both in the uh, run up to the summit, post summit, and then uh, uh, pre launch of climate smart wood group, developing some uh, in depth procurement guidance options for the green building sector, particularly the design and, and uh, building owner uh, team type of uh, audience to be able to make sense of this super complicated landscape. Um, you've heard uh, a great deal of, of depth from David uh, in, in a short presentation about the extensive work that Carbon Leadership Forum and Ecotrust and, and other you know, high powered thought leaders are doing around measuring impact um, and, uh, and, and actually having data driven, a data driven basis to make decisions about differentiation between uh, wood products. And then, you know, of course, we're a tiny organization, we're an upstart organization, and we're working on capacity building, you know, the things that make you successful as a group and, and also fundraising. So, you know, hint, hint, keep us in mind as uh, you're having conversations with uh, organizations who are aligned with our philosophy. So next slide. So if you were going to design uh, an, an organization to try and make an impact on this problem statement and this solution, uh, statement, you you would pretty much go with this list. You know, we, we have uh, a great depth of um, forest science and carbon, uh, embodied carbon science expertise in Carbon Leadership Forum and Ecotrust. We have the uh, entities that are, um, uh, yeah, I, I see the WC is not on there. Sorry, Rachel. <laughs> that's a that's a mistake on our part. We, I'll we would. You, Aaron. Yeah, yeah, I don't, you don't have to, it's all right. Uh, we, you, you'd go with some organizations who work with landowners on the ground and understand how to make real linkages between willing uh, partners as far as implementation and the supply chain. And we have that in spades with Northwest Natural Resource Group's work uh, alongside Sustainable Northwest. You would have, uh, you know, conservation credentials of, uh, you know, leading organizations, both with, you um, uh, you know, policy impacts such as WEC, as well as, uh, you know, a global reach in the form of FSC and World Wildlife Fund. And you would also be informed and led by um, people in the AEC sector who, uh, you know, know what they're talking about and know where the demand sources and, uh, and the areas of interest among their colleagues really, really exist. And also how you solve problems in that venue. And we have that um, in a, in, in a representation from Magnus and Clemensic Associates, which is a super product, uh, progressive uh, design firm. Uh, so uh, next slide. We launched uh, version 1.0 technical work products in um, November of this year, uh, including the, the website that uh, folks have been kind enough to link to in the chat. So go check that out if you haven't already. Um, and as I mentioned previously, the, the primary things that we, we put out for folks to start thinking about are the Climate Smart Forestry Working Definition and Procurement Guidance. So I'm going to walk through those uh, very quickly. 
Um, and uh, we'll go to the next slide. So what we're aiming at in, the, in defining climate smart forestry is not only to, to have something tangible and, and uh, practical, um, but, but also a, a continuum uh, to recognize that, you know, there's a, an infinite variability of forest ecosystems. Uh, there's a spectrum of forest management decisions from more to less climate smart. It's not a binary sort of thing. Um, and, and so that enables uh, design teams to start to articulate their project goals in a way that uh, we can then match up with uh, practices on the ground, uh, willing partners in, in production and along the supply chain. Um, and, and it just sort of, uh, I think, lends the organization a lot of cred credibility in that it's not overly prescriptive and doesn't have a fixed endpoint. Uh, but it has some key features on the next slide. And those are, uh, as Seth already sort of mentioned, uh, so I won't dwell on mitigation and adaptation. David uh, touched on uh, some of our common equity concerns and you know, uh, some basics would be that you don't trample upon the rights of indigenous nations, uh, that you don't have a, a system that uh, disproportionately sort of disadvantages uh, uh, tribal land management entities, for example. Um, uh, again, I mentioned that it's a it's a non non binary type of definition and operates along a continuum that you know as we continue to work on it and develop it is naturally going to have to expand geographically. It's pretty broad now, um, and I think the the key feature that distinguishes it from uh, a lot of other efforts that are maybe happening in this space is that we need it to be above regulatory baseline in order to really be considered uh, climate smart. And the reason for that is that. You know, we do this against the backdrop of needing to keep global temperature rise below uh, a degree and a half. And if we're going to do that, we need to make a meaningful impact on the 40% of emissions that are comprised within the built environment. And if we're going to do that, um, baseline doesn't work. So next slide. We, uh, as I mentioned, uh, oops, we got went ahead a few more than I might have wanted. All right. Uh, as I mentioned, we. Um, uh, produce the procurement guidance, uh, which again is on the website and linked in the chat. This is the uh, uh, august group of, of experts who helped us uh, put that together. Uh, it too, like the definition, is a living product. So it's out in the world circulating. We're, we're hoping and, and looking actively for partners to test out its implementation. And then we come back to it after some period of time and, and, and hopefully improve and refine it. Uh, next slide. The, um, the primary facets of uh, how we've organized the material is sort of uh, helping the, the sector, and I say that it's the green building sector, understand traceability and transparency in the context of the uh, uh, forest sector, the, the wood product supply chain and, and forestry operations in, in the real world. We define uh, several procurement options, which I'll touch on in just a minute. Um, it's important to help uh, firms figure out like where in the process is the best time to really start thinking about what depth of commitment they can have to, uh, uh, to one or more of the options that we describe. And so we try and put it in that context. And then uh, we've listed a number of case studies that, you know, as, as you've heard about in some of the previous presenters, they not only deal with the sort of procurement side of thing, but also, you know, uh, developing the relationships uh, from the forest to the frame, as Timothy said. Um, to, to just sort of help people understand like what it really takes under the present framework to, to make this happen. So next slide. Um, we're gonna jump past this, although I would love to spend more time on it uh, because we've got only so much time to spend. So next slide here, next slide here. Um, one thing that's important for you to understand and if you don't already, is that part of the reason we have to do this at all uh, is the current LCA methodologies for the forest sector are basically just an industry-wide average. And they're structured that way to support the policy position that if you're uh, you know, harvesting from a nation whose forest stocks are, are increasing uh, at the uh, national scale, then you ought to assume neutrality, which is uh, not appropriate uh, for the people who are operating in the building sector that demand higher performance than that. Um, so, so this is, you know, most of the, well, all of the LCA and EPD products that are out there in the world um, operate under, you know, either an assumption of biogenic carbon neutrality or sort of national average. 
uh, and therefore they don't really answer the question that Climate Smart Wood Group is, uh, is trying to answer. Next slide, please. These are the five procurement options that are described in the guidance. Um, you know, obviously reusing, reclaiming, and salvaging from the standpoint of uh, reuse, essentially not, not uh, salvage in the sense that gets controversial around post-fire and post-insect uh, infestation uh, type of operations. You know, reusing existing material is the most carbon smart uh, of, of the options available to anybody. So that's, that's a place that we spend some time. Um, we, we, the treatment that we have of certified wood is uh, that if you need a surrogate for climate smartness, there are actual data to support that FSC certification uh, provides additional climate benefits above baseline. Um, and that if you're going to try and go with other certification methods, you really need to do some more due diligence to chase down you know, what, the, what the real implications are of the forest practices out in the, in the woods. Um, and we do treat it as you know, a surrogate for, uh, for climate smartness if you have no other choice uh, as a procurement team. Uh, because as we know, you know there, there isn't a lot of rigor to the way uh, various certification systems address the issue of climate smart forestry specifically, at least not yet. Um, finally, uh, or thirdly, uh, Brad mentioned the projected huge increase in demand for carbon credits. And for that reason, and really that reason alone, uh, we try to offer some guidance on helping people think through what to do if you want, if, if carbon credits are the way that you choose to go. Although, you know, clearly these other choices are more associated with uh, good practices in the forest uh, directly and, you know, would be a preferred option to credits. But if you, if you don't, uh, you know, if you ignore credits, you sort of do it at your peril. Uh, so that's uh, one, of the, uh, one of the other procurement options we took some time to, uh, to run through. Uh, of course, wood from climate smart forestry operations, and we help people sort of demystify uh, what that really means and how you would go about sort of setting your goals and objectives and, and making sure that you had uh, credible outcomes to, to stand upon. And finally, the, uh, the forest carbon stock change approach, which is the primary focus of David and, and staff's work uh, around uh, measuring impact. Um, it's difficult to do on a, 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 at any scale. Um, and, and the methodologies available right now are just not quite there yet. Um, but we include that as an option because Climate Smart Wood Group is, is of course focused on uh, changing that. Next slide, please. That is the fastest run through that I can complete with uh, uh, one minute's time remaining. What I'd say is that, um, you know, we're here uh, to ask your help. Um, we need partners uh, in form of progressive actors along the different areas of the chain in, in forestry and forest, uh, forest sector supply um, because we're looking to reward good forestry. That's what this whole initiative is about. Um, and, and I know that that's a value that we share. Um, and so as you think about what do I do with this information, that's one really important thing to do is, um, you know, as you're, uh, working in your uh, spheres of influence and able to identify uh, willing partners who are interested in the same things we are, I want to know about it. And so please tell me. And secondly, um, you know, we need partners that are equally progressive and committed in the, in the building sector, in the, uh, the form of, you know, higher profile companies who are trying to uh, uh, do better by their own climate profiles. Um, you know, uh, organizations out in the world who are uh, uh, trying to do something locally significant that um, you know, has a global impact as far as uh, the built environment. We want those uh, uh, opportunities as pilot projects to help get some of this uh, guidance out in the world and, and be able to adapt it and improve it based on people's experiences. And so we're looking for, you, know, you could call them pilot projects. I'd like them to have a bit more depth uh, than just pilots, but um, uh, as those opportunities uh, cross your mind or come across your transom, uh, I want to know about those too. Um, and as always, you know, if, uh, if you'd like to talk more um, or learn more, uh, this is how to get a hold of me. So with that, I will uh, wrap up for our Q&A. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks so much to all of our speakers. I'll give you all a passing grade for staying reasonably on time. We've got some space left for Q&A. Um, so all of you can feel free to turn your cameras on and come on back for the Q&A. 
Um, if I can attempt to sort of summarize that complex web we've woven, I think the message is on a global scale, there's interest and demand in sustainably sourced wood products as part of a climate solution. At a local level in the architecture, engineering and construction sector, we're seeing strong interest and efforts and sort of problem solving at a project level, how to bring that climate smart wood into projects. We're seeing an increasing amount of kind of data and information and growing transparency work on carbon accounting to better understand all of that, um, all of that information across the supply chain. And we, we know in many ways uh, the climate impacts of different management practices as, as Seth spoke about. And so the Climate Smart Wood Group has come together to try to connect those pieces across the supply chain um, and support uh, bringing market incentives, bringing um, you know, dollars to Climate Smart Wood to enable that management on the ground. So with that attempt to sort of summarize, um, I'll start off with a question that there's been some active conversation about in the chat too around uh, different landowners. Um, so uh, how do you envision the Climate Smart Wood Group's work and the USDA incentive funds as relating to different types of landowners? You know, among small forest landowners, tribal nations, community forests, public lands, industrial forest landowners, uh, are all those uh, landowners kind of on the table for engagement? What are the priorities among them? Um, and I will look to someone to jump in with some, some starting thoughts. I, I've got a thought there. Uh, to some degree, the, um, the opportunity from USDA was framed in terms of small producers with a, or a preference for supporting um, equitable investment in climate smart commodities. So there was, there was a track that was um, sort of targeted towards small producers. And that is something that actually resonated pretty naturally with the, the organizations that got together and put this uh, proposal together. So there, within the funding we got, we proposed and will probably be, well, we'll definitely assuming USDA uh, uh, continues to like us, uh, we'll be delivering on uh, investments to small uh, small producers, tribal producers, possibly some community forests as well. Um, there are some other forest-based grants out there that were funded through this that um, are likely to go toward larger producers. Um, and I'd say in terms it, in terms of the mission of the whole Climate Smart Wood Group, no bias against the size, the bigger the better, um, just a matter of what the opportunity presented in this case. Uh, Seth, I see you've got your hand up, jump in. Sure. Um, so, you know, we're as an organization that works with land, forest landowners, we're keenly aware that each landowner brings their own set of motivations to the table uh, and their own set of objectives for managing their forest land. So the um, incentives that would, uh, and hurdles that, uh, that are faced by an industrial forest landowner, which say may be translated more into, um, uh, you know, financial terms and how can you financially incentive incentivize the production of climate smart wood might be quite different from say a small family forest landowner who uh, th their barriers are finding someone who's willing to come stay in their 20 acres of forest land which are over dense and which they can't have not been able to thin profitably or they they perhaps only see their options as clear cutting or letting it grow. So, you know, there, there might be a barrier of the availability of, of technology or workforce or uh, just information. So we feel like each of those different segments need to be addressed differently. Thanks, Seth. Any other reflections on that topic from the panelists? Uh, I just say that, you know, the, for the part of the Climate Smart Wood Group's um, priority setting, uh, small forest landowner uh, engagement would be at least as important as, as any other. Um, there's, there's no uh, story to tell from the social benefits, from the um, habitat benefits, from uh, the water quality benefits of a cement quarry. You know, that's a, that's a competitive advantage in, uh, you know, nature-based climate, 
climate solutions in the built environment that only forestry has. And for a long time, um, people have been looking for ways to incentivize um, you know, good decisions around forest management. And, and this is as powerful as op an opportunity as has ever been. Um, and so uniquely, uh, you know, small forest landowners or family forest landowners or whatever term you want to describe, you know, have, uh, you know, have a climate story to tell that, uh, that others don't. And it's just a matter of like scaling and how do you make it, um, you know, how do you make it really work depending on how much resource the, the project team you're working with, you know, has to dedicate to it. Um, you kind of referenced conversion, Aaron, there's a question here about um, how small forest landowners can be brought into the mix, which we've already kind of touched upon to address concerns of justice and land conversion. So I'm going to broaden that a bit and ask um, panelists to speak about this equity and kind of justice piece around climate smart wood. You know, how does that uh, come into the conversation? Um, and, and I guess, David, I'd kind of prompt you to speak a little bit about um, work with tribes that Ecotrust is planning to do under the USDA grant, if you're willing. Uh, uh, sure. So, I mean, taking taking a step back to the broader question you raised about how does equity factor into this, I do think one of the things that we were really adamant needed to be included in a definition uh, uh, of climate smart forestry, when you've seen it come through other bodies, they often refer to something generally as the human dimension or something the way that like academics refer to people and how important communities are um, and fail to recognize, I think, the reality of the uh, climate climate situation that the responsibility and the impacts are not shared equally uh, uh, among everybody. Uh, and so I think the in order for climate smart forestry to actually be durable uh, uh, and credible, it actually needs to acknowledge that head on um, and address it. And so a major part of the work that we uh, um, are doing uh, has to do uh, with applying what, what's called a targeted universalism approach uh, uh, to focus on uplifting the leadership and spotlighting leadership that's being demonstrated by tribes uh, in this regard. And so, you know, you can see from space, you know, that tribes look different from their neighbors. Uh, uh, I would much uh, uh, prefer that you actually uh, get to know the tribes that are in your area uh, and learn about the amazing stewardship that they're doing. It's wildly diverse. Uh, but I think what we uh, 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 noticed from the outset was that tribes were already and have been doing creative and compelling uh, leadership in climate smart forestry that was often not being recognized at all by the broader forestry community. Um, and so I think that a big part of the work that we're hoping to do on the Climate Smart Commodities Grant is to make sure that uh, uh, tribes that are producing timber into the market can uh, begin to use the impact reporting metrics that are sought by the people that are intentionally targeting procurement uh, decisions. And so that the, the impact metrics and reporting can be done in a way that aligns with what a green builder is wanting to see. Uh, uh, and so hopefully that that will allow more of those transactions to happen and more money to flow uh, directly to tribes that are actually doing great, uh, great forestry work around the region. Thanks, David. I see Micah's hand is up. I'll just flag before you go, Micah. We're um, just hit the scheduled end time of the panel, but we'll extend by five minutes or so for those who can stay a little longer so we can have a bit more conversation. Micah, go for it. Thanks, I'll be brief. In addition to a big plus one to everything that David just shared, um, I would just recommend folks, I, I see the Climate Smart Wood Procurement Guidance was posted there. At the end, there are several uh, you know, case studies that serve as examples of how when you're imply, applying the combination of the satellite imagery methods and the just direct supply chain engagement, you can really do a lot to say where your wood is coming from that isn't really achievable through just status quo supply chains and timber markets. So there's a lot of this that just naturally makes it more possible to say where your wood came from and makes it harder for a small producer to just get lost in the huge mix of uh, industrial mill world. So there's some really great transparency opportunities there. Thanks, Micah. Brad? Uh, yeah, just maybe to put a bit of an exclamation point on a, on a point that David made a, a bit earlier. You know, the assumption that all wood is good and all wood is, is carbon neutral or better is fundamentally unjust. Uh, if you look at who's producing wood in North America or in the United States, let's say, 
about 60% of the you know, forest products producing lands are actually family woodlands. Uh, now, not all of those are practicing climate smart forestry, however you define it, but many of them are, and most of them are very low intensity forest management. They're, this, these are their properties. This is their heritage. This is land they spend time with their families on. And to, to equate that land um, in, in through a similar vein with the tribal lands as well, to equate that with industrial, intensive, chemical laden, clear cut, dependent in, in management is is unjust to the people who are managing their lands well. And so, you know, the systems are not set up to differentiate wood right now, which is frankly one of the core reasons we created the Climate Smart Wood Group is to create some strength in numbers to change the way systems operate, to provide more transparency and segregation of wood products and other strategies to actually get Climate Smart Wood into construction projects. But at the core, this all wood is good mantra is unjust and we need to change that. Thank you for putting a finer point on it, Brad. I wish we had a lot more time to talk through a lot more questions. So I'll just end with, with a final question for you all of um, how can different stakeholders and different parts of the supply chain get involved? What are the different roles for those different actors to play in sort of solving this puzzle? And uh, I don't necessarily only mean the Climate Smart Wood Group. Obviously, Aaron, please speak to how different folks can get involved in the Climate Smart Wood Group, but more generally, any reflections on how different parts of the supply chain can support this shift towards climate smart wood? You know, I, I would I would just jump in. You know, from the building side, it's really uh, the first step is transparency. Really, we're trying to get um, our partners and our clients to just ask the question: Where is our wood coming from? And then everything can flow from that. So that's, you know, it might seem really uh, elementary, but um, there's a lot of ground to be gained just by um, asking for transparency. Absolutely. All things flow from transparency. Any other reflections? Okay. Uh, well, uh, we're happy to continue this conversation at any time. Just reach out to any of us or to Aaron as the director of the Climate Smart Wood Group. Um, thank you so much to our panelists for such a great panel um, and for sharing all the work ahead. Um, and thank you to the audience for joining us for our sixth annual Carbon Conference. You'll receive an email uh, tomorrow with information on how to access recordings. Uh, for the webinars. And we're so grateful that you all took time out of your week to join us. Uh, we hope the conversation continues offline. Um, a huge thank you to all of our presenters from all the panels. It really gives me a lot of hope to hear about all the inspiring work happening across the Pacific Northwest. One final plug for those of you who live in the Seattle area, come join us in person tonight at Optimism Brewing to continue conversations there at 5.30 PM. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that it takes many, many hands to make this conference a reality. In addition to our presenters, um, I also want to thank our partners and sponsors, uh, Caber Law, EFM uh, Investments and Advisory, the Nature Conservancy Washington, Pacific Forest Trust, and Sustainable Northwest. Last but not least, a huge thank you to my wonderful, wonderful colleagues at WEC for making this conference happen, particularly the forest team, which is Katie Fields and Alec Brown, and our comms team, including Zachary Pullen and Ida Amarul, uh, and to our partners at Blue Spruce Strategies, who you haven't seen, but they're behind the scenes, feel free to jump on camera, uh, Michael Panuelas and Lisa McShane. So thanks to you all. Um, thanks everyone here and have a great rest of your week. <laughs>